Hey everybody, it's Allie and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, April 7th, 2019. For the second week in a row, I have to start out with some casting news and this was late breaking casting news that I didn't know about when I recorded last Sunday's YNR chat. This is some real life drama here. Gina Tognoni is out as Phyllis. Michelle Stafford is back in. My first reaction to all of this was complete disbelief. I truly thought that this was an April Fool's joke or something. I went online, looked it up. It's completely true. I, I'm i really shocked. I'm really truly shocked because when we had the takeover of YNR by the new leadership, I assumed there would be some people on the chopping block, but I never would have dreamed in a million years that Gina Tognoni would have been the one to go and it seems like from everything I've read that Gina was let go in favor of bringing Michelle Stafford back onto the show, back to the role that she originated. This is a really surprising move <laughs> from the YNR brass and from where I'm sitting, honestly, it seems like a very political decision, like a very corporate decision, because I talk to YNR fans every week and I haven't heard anyone clamoring for a recast of this character. Gina Tognoni did a phenomenal job filling phenomenally big shoes. I mean, she won an Emmy for her portrayal as Phyllis. So perhaps the new leadership at YNR were just fans of Michelle Stafford. Perhaps they thought that wooing her back to YNR could maybe bring some general hospital fans over to the show because Michelle Stafford has a current role on GH. And maybe they just assumed that the YNR fans wouldn't complain about it, that everybody would be okay. May, who knows, maybe this decision had something to do with the fact that Gina had to commute for the role. I noticed that in her Twitter statement, which didn't say much of anything. It's always, thanks for the wonderful memories. See you later. Uh, I love everybody behind the scenes. You know, I mean, it's all very uh, nice and polite, but she did happen to mention that she commuted for the role. And I don't know where she was commuting from, but is there any chance that CBS felt that those reimbursables for like airfare or travel was that too much and they thought maybe Michelle would work a little better financially for them because she's local I think I don't know I, I am struggling to wrap my brain around the decision and either way I think what we have here in this decision is something that's gonna make a lot of people happy and I think it's gonna make a lot of people unhappy. So where do you fall on this spectrum? That's gonna be our poll question of the week. Who's your favorite Phyllis? Go to yrchat.com, weigh in on everything about this casting drama and tell me who you feel really connected you to the role of Phyllis. Are you an original Michelle Stafford enthusiast or were you someone who appreciated what Gina brought to the role a little bit more? YRChat.com. Go vote in that poll. Go sound off about the recast. I can't wait to hear what everyone is saying and thinking. I've said it more than once. I personally am a really big fan of Gina Tognoni's version of Phyllis. To me, Gina was able to really perfectly balance being fierce, being a force to be reckoned with, with also having an air of class 
and collectedness. Gina Tognoni, for me, pulled Phyllis out of the realm of crazy town <laughs> and into the role of a serious career-minded woman, like somebody who I could take seriously and who I could maybe even trust a little bit. Now, true, Gina Tognoni did not build the car. She's not the writer, she's not the, you know, she, she didn't have probably much to do with the direction that the, the character took when she took the role. I mean, the actors and actresses can only work with what they're given, but Gina Tognoni, although she didn't build the car, she certainly drove it, and I think she drove it well. I mean, I, I, I'm a fan uh, of Gina's Phyllis more so than the original. I, you know, I've, I've said a couple of times over the years there were some things about Michelle Stafford's portrayal that I did not care for, but I think that just means that I'm in a place where I can be won over. You know, she can win me over, I'm open to it, I'm not going to shut myself down to it entirely, even though I will say my first reaction was disappointment, was definitely disappointment. Um, the character direction for Phyllis has changed significantly since Michelle Stafford was in the role. I mean, we are not in the octopus in the bed phase of Phyllis right now. That was a completely different person. So I'm open to seeing how Michelle has grown as an actress, what material she will be given to work with, and what she can bring to the role now. What I would like to see now is a, a, a Phyllis 4.0. A Phyllis version 4.0. Like, I would rather see that than a return to Phyllis 1.0 or 2.0. And I define that as Phyllis 1.0 kind of being the beginning, the Danny obsession, the Christine obsession, the octopus in the bed. That is Phyllis 1.0. Phyllis 2.0 to me is after Michelle left the show for a little while, they brought her back and made her more of a serious character. They gave her the relationship with Nick, then the relationship with Jack. Phyllis at that point became more of a serious romantic lead instead of just the crazy, kooky character who was on the sidelines causing drama for the main cast. And then Phyllis 3.0 being the Gina Tognoni version, and that's where we are right now, and that's what really pulled me in. So I am hoping that Phyllis 4.0 is, is something completely new. Because I think that'll also help me get over the feeling of heartbreak for Gina Tognoni. I just feel awful for her, and I hope that she is at peace with the decision. I hope that it didn't go down in a nasty way. I, I hope that the people behind the scenes at YNR treated her respectfully considering she did win an Emmy for them and she brought a lot to the show. I just don't see how it could not be a slap in the face. Uh, but hopefully there, the she'll, she's come to a level of understanding with it. I, th I think she is one hell of a talent uh, and I'm sure that she has a whole field of opportunities in front of her now. I mean, hell! If YNR is so interested in bringing Michelle Stafford back as Phyllis, I wish they'd throw us a curveball and then just cast Gina Tognoni in a completely new role on the show. Not only is Gina Tognoni out as Phyllis, but Phyllis is out as CEO of Jabot. It's almost as if the new writers we're trying to push this character out the door, no? Am I reading too much into that or is that something that you were feeling too? I mean, this has been one of the worst weeks ever for Phyllis. She's a pariah. She's a scapegoat. She is last week's leftovers. Nobody wants her, except maybe Lauren. Well, Ashley's master plan was, it turned out, a Jabot takeover, but in the most loveliest <laughs> and sisterly and family of ways, right? I mean, she gave them a choice. They could sign the company over to her, or they are 
perfectly well able to just continue to keep the company afloat with no products, no patents, and no money. And lovingly, she gave them 24 hours to make this decision. I mean, they had a whole day to figure out what they were going to do with this internationally renowned family company. Well, the only thing that the Abbots and the board can agree on right away is that Phyllis is the one who got them into this mess. Phyllis is the scapegoat and she's got to go. Phyllis never did a full background check on Carrie. She never went to the trouble to make sure that Carrie Johnson's face actually matched the person who was standing right in front of her. I mean, who would think to go do that? It's crazy that they really zeroed in on Phyllis not knowing that Carrie was an imposter when Jack didn't know that Carrie was an imposter. Nobody else bothered to double check the facts either. But where Phyllis did definitely screw up was that she was so hot to trot to sign Carrie Johnson slash Dominique onto the company, into the company, that she never bothered to put a no compete clause in Carrie's contract. So that means that Jabot doesn't even have any legal recourse against Carrie for spending all of this time developing products and then registering the patents uh, to a different company. So Phyllis does have to take the heat on that one. This, since the board is already assembled, they decide to make their very first order of business voting Phyllis out without a second thought. I mean, they were just done with her. Even Tracy jumped on board and let Phyllis have it. When Tracy is mad at you, <laughs> that's when you know that you really screwed up. Now the second order of business was to elect a brand new CEO. Gee, is there anyone in this room who might be qualified to take over this position? Anyone in this room who's been, I don't know, running this company for his entire life and who might be uniquely motivated to tell Ashley to kiss their butts? Oh, Smiling Jack. <laughs> Old Smiling Jack back in his office, back in his chair. Although the office and the chair do look a little bit different from the last time he was there. That office has been remodeled. The old office kind of suited him. The new office is maybe even a little too fresh and chic for Jack Abbott, but I'm gonna go with it because the title fits him. You know, the, the title fits like an old glove. And you know, I do love, I, I, I love seeing Jack where I, where I like seeing him, where I've known him. That's kind of the classic Jack role and spot and it's okay with me. I mean, nobody can look wistfully around a room the way that that man can. <laughs> he has crafted that into an art, just walking into a room and ah. Oh, looking around and thinking of all the memories. And we got a lot of that <laughs> when Jack took over uh, the CEO position. I mean, the, the, the board vote was quick. Everything about that was quick. I'm so annoyed about those two extra floating votes, like those two extra board members who were on the phone during the debating process. I just found that annoying and unrealistic. Who are those two extra guys? We never even see them. I wish YNR would just drop that. Like the fact that they had to be on the phone is just yuck. Just make that go away and let the board be who we can see. I mean, the fact that like Billy's on the phone with him saying, oh yeah, yeah, oh well, we have a split vote from these two people who have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I, I just, that pulls me out of any sense of reality that I might have. Um, yeah, I don't know who those guys are. Uh, I would much rather hear from the main family and cast. I don't even know why they keep Tracy on the board when they don't really even listen to a thing that she says. Tracy is the only one with any sense amongst this group. 
Tracy actually voted in favor of Ashley's proposal. She wanted to let Ashley merge My Beauty with Jabot because it would force a merger of the families. I think that's where Tracy's mind was. Like, okay, fine, let's just all work together. Like, to me, Tracy's vote makes total sense from the perspective of a loving, caring, decent human being who wants her family to get along. It was interesting, though, that Abby abstained from the voting. She was not about to be caught between business and personal yet again, which is nice, I understand it, but it was also boring, <laughs> okay? You're in this scene. I mean, thanks so much for taking minutes, but you need to come down on one side or the other. I was a little annoyed with Abby about that. Like, this is a soap, make a decision, take a side. <laughs> I was actually, almost kind of curious to know if Abby would actually take Ashley's offer to go to Paris to be her second in command at my beauty. I mean, I know that Ashley's got or that Abby's got her own life and her own projects going on here right now, but I thought, well, hey, it's a possibility that the new Abby might want to start a new life in Paris, but no. No, no, no. Ashley is all on her own here. Just just her and her patents and her rampant sense of sibling rivalry that just will flare up and never go away. Jack pays a visit to Ashley just like she knew he would, but it was not to accept her merger offer. It was to tell her to just take her offer and shove it. You know, in a way, I do think that Jack and Ashley both do truly want to find a way to work together, to bring the family together, but they both have such completely different ideas of what that means and how that works. Jack thinks that he was born for this, he was groomed for this, and he was. Jack thinks that he's the one with the brilliant business mind, so he should always lead the company. And Ashley believes that she is the scientist, she is the innovator, so she should be the one in charge. And they just decide at the end of the day, well, you know what? If it's both of us just saying, I'm better, no, I'm better, no, I'm better, then why don't we just put it to the test? Let Ashley go ahead, keep on running her company. We'll let Jack run Jabot, see if he's able to pull it out of this tailspin, and we'll just see. We'll just see who comes out on top. So like, let the battle begin. And let, let the battle begin with a really big, nice gift basket. Why don't you, Ashley? sends Jack to the, the house. He sent, she sends him a big ol' gift basket. It was filled to the brim with My Beauty's newest product line, which, by the way, was paid for by Jabot. Jabot is the one who put all of the research and development dollars into this product line and now Ashley just has it for her company and she just sends it in a gift basket to Jack and, uh, and also like right in the center of the gift basket the largest biggest bottle <laughs> of cologne that I have ever seen in my life. It was an almost novelty sized giant bottle of Jack of Hearts <laughs> cologne. I hope that Jack never makes it through that bottle because I would feel sorry for absolutely everyone else in the office <laughs> if he's able to use up all of that cologne. But Ashley, she is evil right now. She is a naughty girl. She includes in the gift basket a little note that is taunting Jack. She's telling him in the note that, you know, good luck, but I hate to tell you, you're going to be the one 
you're going to be known as the one who buried Jabot Cosmetics. So you go ahead. You make this decision. You chose not to work with me, and now you're going to be the one who's going to take the fall for it. I can't understand why Ashley is so callous about her family company, but I suppose after all the years that she's been fighting for it and over it, maybe she's just done. It's real poor sportsmanship, though. I mean, everything Jack did to her was awful, awful, but there's just something very immature about the way Ashley is responding here. Like, maybe she'd like to go and TP the Abbott Mansion while she's at it. Wasn't it so weird to hear Carrie switch over into a British accent? I kind of loved it. There was something about Carrie in her final moments and in her British accent that made her seem more intriguing and mysterious. I wish I would have felt a little more remorse from her though. She seemed kind of cold. I mean, Jack was only able to steal away maybe five private minutes with Carrie before she packed her bags and headed back to Paris and when they were talking she was insisting to Jack that her feelings for him were real and by the way that's the same thing that she said to Phyllis like basically Jack and Phyllis both had the same feeling of betrayal by Carrie and they both went to her and said did you ever really love me <laughs> which was a little bit pathetic but um Jack wants to have some kind of resolution on what's happened with Carrie, she tells him, no, no, like the relationship part was right, but I had a job that I was doing. I'll tell you what, why don't you come back to Paris with me and I'll prove it to you that I did have real feelings for you and that we can have the life that we planned. I don't know though, how could Carrie have real feelings for Jack when it seems like she doesn't really even know him. How can she even think that Jack would consider leaving his family company right now? Inside the office, the CEO office, the whole place is practically on fire. You don't know Jack at all if you think that he's gonna just walk away from that. And of course he didn't. He pretty much tells her to go to hell and she just kind of floats away. And thus ends <laughs> the tale of Carrie slash Dominique, I guess, for now. Unless she shows back up in a couple of months pregnant with Jack's baby. Lauren wants out of her partnership with Jabot. She's looking around now for someone who could give her an influx of cash, someone who could maybe just be a minority stakeholder in Fenmore's, and then she would have the ability to buy back Fenmore's from Jabot. She would have the opportunity to get her family back 100% or at least majority, uh, which actually she does, does still have the majority, but she doesn't want to have to deal with Jack and his 49%. Enter Phyllis. <laughs> Phyllis would love to have a, a stake in Fenmore. She would love to work with Lauren. And I suspect she would also really love to have an opportunity to enact a little bit of revenge on Jack and Jabot and the people who just turned around and kicked her out into the street. Jack refuses to even give Phyllis her severance package. She says that she built in a golden parachute for herself and Jack says, well, yeah, you could have it if you were fired without cause, which is kind of crummy. What's the point of a golden parachute? I mean, it sounds so wonderful, just parachuting down in a golden way. Well, what's the point of having that if they can just say, nope, you don't get it? So she, Jack denies her, gives her no money, and also 
also later in the week, he denies her request to just let Fenmore's go. Just let it be bought so that at least Phyllis has a, play, a new place to work. She can just work with Lauren and even though everything else in her life has gone away and blown up, she could at least have this. I found it interesting that Phyllis thought that Jack owed her that. I mean, even though I don't think Phyllis necessarily deserved to take all the heat for what happened at Jabot, I also thought it was odd that she expected Jack to just do her this favor. Especially when, I mean, Jabot is, it's in a bad way right now. I, it just, it's just odd. And it seemed also that Phyllis was maybe trying to play on that personal relationship with Jack a little bit. She sat down and talked about Marco. I mean, it was a, a really, really good scene. Again, speaking to the power of Gina Chognoni, but she sat down and talked to Jack about what had happened with Marco, and she seemed very self-reflective. I mean, we have seen Phyllis over the past month really betray, betray, betray everyone in her life, and it does seem like right now and in that scene, she was experiencing the karma that was coming back onto her, uh, and I, I would think that part of that karma might also be taking total responsibility or maybe part of her process of getting over it might be taking responsibility for her own actions but she really seemed angry with Jack over this decision and Jack didn't help he was making little comments about summer and how summer is an abbot now well I mean you can't expect Phyllis to not strike back after you say something like that. You've taken her job and she's already lost her dignity and now you're implying that maybe she's going to lose her daughter too. I mean, I, I, get, uh, I, I get where Phyllis is coming from uh, in that way. She tells Jack that he's going to regret it. She warns him that he's going to regret you know, not working with her. So I'm assuming that on top of the collision course that Jack and Ashley are on, I think we're also going to see a collision course between Phyllis plus Lauren and Jack and Billy. It's going to be Fenmore's versus Jabot. Jabot has decided to get into the fashion game now. They've decided that the way they're going to save the company is to start producing clothes. The way they're going to save the company is by doing, not the tried and true, <laughs> but by doing this new thing that they don't know anything about. That is the route. And it cannot be a coincidence that Jabot's starting a clothing company at the same time that Lauren's trying to gain back control of Fenmore's. A department store so I don't know I'm kind of thinking that maybe Fenmore's versus Jabot will be the rivalry that carries us through the rest of the year if Summer had actually told Phyllis what was going on with the surgery what was going on with Kyle that wedding never would have happened Phyllis was able to suss out in about five seconds that what was going on with Kyle was a big bunch of BS. And I never would have dreamed when this Kyle Lola summer triangle started to emerge that it would have turned me so far off of Kyle. Kyle sleeping with Summer again and then rolling over and checking his phone, looking at a text message, another text message that he sent to Lola? It is icky, and it is a big turn off to me. You needed to text Lola, oh, good to see you. It was really good to see you the other day. Did you get home okay? Just wanted to make sure that you got home okay. Wait a minute. You saw her at the coffee house. She lives upstairs. Just wanted to make sure you got home all day, okay? All she had to do was walk up a flight of stairs. It is so transparent to me. It is making Kyle look like he could become a cheater. He hasn't done anything wrong yet, but it's putting him in a position where he could. And I'm sorry. Kyle, but you do not get to have sex with Summer and then have the romantic feelings and ideals and relationships with 
Lola. He is trying to have his cake and eat it too. You can't have sex with Summer, love with Lola, and my respect at the same time. You have to make a choice and you have to stand by it. Nobody's asking him to stop loving Lola. I'm just asking him to stop pursuing Lola. And it feels clear to me that he's trying to get his foot in the door with her one way or another. I don't think he's actively thinking, ooh, I wanna have an affair with her, but he would if he could. Well, I mean, I don't know. Summer uh, found Kyle's phone right after they slept together she wakes up he's out he's off and out she rolls over finds the phone he was looking at he had a picture of Lola queued up on the phone it's probably his freaking phone's wallpaper image it's like his desktop photo on his laptop too I mean how disrespectful can you be you married Summer and you're pulling up another girl's photo on your phone I realize that the marriage to Summer is twisted and unconventional, but he still said the vows. He's still given lip service about being in the relationship with Summer. He still made the promises. Well, Summer quietly confronts Kyle about it in the most mild manner of ways she confronts Kyle about it. And he agreed that he would delete the picture of Lola, that he would even delete Lola's phone number from his phone. Okay, but he can't delete Lola from his head. And so it also makes me more annoyed with Summer that she's just allowing him to get away with this and that she just swallows her pride and tugboats along, like try, trying to be this woman that maybe someday, eventually, hopefully, Kyle will fall in love with. No! Screw him! At this point, Lola actually had most of my respect for not answering those text messages, for not giving in to what she obviously would love to be real too. I was proud of Lola for not playing this game. And then in the previews for Monday, it sounds like Lola is suggesting that she and Kyle go upstairs and get a hotel room together. I, uh, that's really shocking. And you know he's gonna turn her down, lest the viewers hate him. He is gonna backtrack on that. He's gonna say, Lola, no, I can't. I made promises to Summer. And then I'm supposed to swoon and go, oh, okay, well, he's a good boy. He made the right decision. I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed with, with Kyle. I'm annoyed with Summer. And now I'm supposed to just throw everything that I know about Lola right out the window. I mean, the, the one thing I know about Lola is how she's all about <laughs> her morals and her principles. She wouldn't sleep with Kyle when they were dating, but now she's okay carrying on with a married man? Was the liver transplant accidentally a brain transplant too? Like, did, not, did Dr. Nate accidentally take Lola's brain and put it in Summer's? And Summer's brain put it into Lola. It's like, cause suddenly Summer has become this docile little lamb and Lola's become the man eater? Sharon and Ray went out on their first date this week. And I think Sharon spent way too much time trying to figure out which would be the perfect dress for her date, when we all know the only thing that mattered was the lingerie set underneath, and that barely mattered because they ended up getting naked. I mean, Sharon and Ray could have just skipped dinner and went straight for the meal. <laughs> oh, I mean, I don't know. I thought it was hot, but my favorite part of the whole thing was when Sharon acted for about five minutes. Like she was too demure, too pure to be dating Ray while he's technically still married to Mia. I mean, come on, Jaren. 
<laughs> I would say that you lost your claim to purity a few decades ago. Our poll question from last week was, would you like to see Sharon and Ray make love? Or do you just want to see Sharon and Ray move on from each other? Wow, 61% of you said move on. That's kind of surprising. I thought the majority vote was going to be telling these two crazy kids to go ahead and make love. I mean, you know, I saw a lot of comments. People were either saying yes, chemistry, or no, chemistry. Um, so I think chemistry is kind of subjective. It just depends. Some couples, I guess, hit a, a major vein and some don't. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I voted that they uh, should make love, and I enjoyed the lovemaking. There was certainly a lot of it, though. <laughs> This week, I mean, my goodness, Ray wanted to go all night and in the morning. I mean, there was a lot of it. But I do have to say, I was back on board with Mariah this week when she was interrogating Ray. She came home, because she still lives with Sharon. She came home and found Ray and Sharon all cozy in the living room, and Mariah then decided to just invite herself <laughs> to their dinner. She kind of crashed their little private dinner party, probably just to find out what was actually going on here. And Sharon announced during dinner that she and Ray are an item now. I mean, it is a little sudden. Well, it is and it isn't, right? They've been dancing around this relationship and this love story for a while now, but I really thought, well, it has got to be O-V-E-R when a man slaps handcuffs on you, hauls you down to the police station, and books you for homicide, but I guess not. <laughs> Maybe I'm just too traditional. Well, I loved the moment where Mariah, before she left, gave Ray a little looky look and said, I'm keeping my eyes on you. I got my eyes on you if you hurt Sharon. Oh, and he might just too. He might just. Nick also got an eyeful of the happy new couple this week when, she, when Sharon tells Ray, her shirtless new boyfriend, to go and answer her front door for the delivery man. And Nick is standing there when the door opens. I mean, you gotta feel a little sorry for Nick, right? He is knocking on the door. Ray opens it up shirtless. He's answering the door at the house that Nick built for Sharon that's sitting on Nick's family's private property. And Nick's has to be like, it's cool, it's cool, I don't mind, doesn't bother me at all. I think there was a whole lot more to that job offer than just the job. Nick claims that he's there to offer Sharon a job, Abby's old position, in fact, at Dark Horse. Dark Horse is losing employees left and right. Did we even see Jack discuss his resignation with Nick or even a phone call or anything? Because Jack got voted in as CEO of Jabot and then the next thing we know, Nick is just acknowledging that Jack is gone. I don't think we're ever gonna see that. It's Dark Horse and that whole story just did not get developed. I don't even know if Dark Horse, it might be ended up going the way of the underground. Dark Horse might be going underground. Barely even an acknowledgement. Sharon does turn down the offer, though. I was surprised. I thought she was going to take it. I, but she, <laughs> the, Sharon turns down the offer. And the excuse that she gives for not taking the job is that she would rather take this time to just explore her relationship with Ray. She doesn't want to have to be bothered to work a job right now. She'd just rather explore her relationship with Ray. Wouldn't it be fabulous if you could just choose not to work? Just choose not to have a job because you would rather stay home and get freaky with your new boyfriend all day? <laughs> Oh, the life. <laughs> oh, I laughed when she said that. Well, later that day, Sharon comes home 
and she finds a lovely little greeting card right up on her door. It's a greeting card that's been delivered to Sharon's house, but for Ray. Hmm. It is a little card from Mia with a sonogram photo on one side and then a little note on the back side letting Ray know that this is the very first baby Rosales photo. Oh. Uh, but uh, but which, which Rosales is the father? And I also just don't even know how we went from paying for P to now Mia having a real pregnancy. I don't know. It seems like a rewrite to me. It all seems like it's pointed in, in a certain direction. And I'll tell you what, I can hear Sharon and what she's thinking right now. I don't need to see Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday's show. I know what Sharon is thinking. She's going to go to Ray and she is going to say, you and I can't be. You must be with the mother of your child. You've wanted this for so long. No, we must end our passionate affair and you have to go be a father. You can't do to your child what was done to you. Hey, Nick, is that job still available? I loved Mariah and Tessa's fire escape set. That was fun. It reminded me of my 20s, standing on the balcony of my one-bedroom apartment, looking out upon Chicago and all the, the lights at night. I mean, it had a very nighttime, twinkly, urban feel to it with, uh, the, with the Christmas lights wrapped around the cast iron bars. I thought that was cool and fun and something visually different. I also thought it was very cool that Mariah brought, uh, bought Tessa's guitar back from the pawn shop and gave it to her as a gift. I wasn't expecting Tessa to be so afraid to play the guitar again and afraid to sing again, but I actually could really understand that. You know, like feeling insecure about the one thing that you thought you were good at. That's very relatable to me. I think that would be very relatable to anyone. And that did draw me back into her story. That did make me curious about her a little more. So I'm looking forward to seeing what they have planned for her. And I also kind of wonder if maybe Tessa knows Brandon. Victoria leaves her family and her children, who she's been estranged from for months now at this point, to go rent a hotel room in Vegas under a fake name. Why would she go to Las Vegas to sit alone in a hotel room the Las Vegas Strip isn't exactly the first place I think of for a private, <laughs> relaxing time. And also, how did Victoria not realize that Brandon was going to recognize her as Victoria Newman, especially right now, when her face is plastered all over the National Inquisitor. <laughs> I wonder if Mr. Musician Brandon knew who she was all along. I mean, what rock star goes striking up conversations with random hotel guests behind closed doors that is so weird. He probably saw her at the airport, then went to the hotel and flipped through the guest registry, found what sounded like the fakest name ever, Jenny Lambertson. <laughs> And then he found the room number. He was like, yep, I'm sure that's it. Victoria Newman, no doubt. Well, boring, predictable Victoria Newman was planning on just spending the night in her hotel room alone. But Brandon slips a flyer under her door for his rock music review. <laughs> 
And she decides to go. I'm sure that Victoria decided to go because she's just trying to replace the nightmares that are in her head with anything else. Doesn't even matter what it is. But she ended up having a great time. She invites the entire band back to her hotel room and she's telling Brandon all of these tales of her life story as Jenny Lambertson. How Jenny Lambertson is an artist and she travels the world and she's actually setting up a, a show in Vegas right now. And the truth is, everything that Victoria said, everything that she was presenting about Jenny Lambertson's life is not Jenny Lambertson's life. It's Victoria's life story. Victoria went to art school. Victoria studied and lived in Europe for a number of years. This is just a part of herself that's been locked away. And so if nothing else, I am grateful to Brandon and the Bloody Thorns <laughs> for reconnecting her to that. Now, Brandon also managed to reconnect Victoria with her passionate side. <laughs> he stops by her hotel room the next night and gives her an all access pass. it was just flirtiness and this foreplay where they're both pretending to be Jenny and Thelonious, just like two anonymous normies. <laughs> Anyone who you might just find out walking around on the Las Vegas Strip. And this is very intriguing to them both because Brandon's famous, Victoria's famous, and they're just pretending that they're ordinary folks. And the next thing you know, she is peeling off his threadbare tee. He probably paid $60 for that little piece of fabric tee. <laughs> Maybe more, who knows? Okay, well, I mean, really. Is partying and drinking and having sex with some hot random rocker in Las Vegas the most physically and psychologically thing, healthy thing for Victoria to be doing right now? No, of course not. Um, there are so many better ways that I'm sure uh, a, a psychologist or a therapist would tell her to deal with what she's been through. But, you know, after the year that she's had, so what? I, there's just a part of me that thinks, you know, you go ahead and grab a little bit of happiness, Victoria, because it's fleeting. You know, I mean, life is hard and she's been through a lot. Whatever it is that's going to make you smile a little bit and rejuvenate you and maybe reinterest you in life, maybe that is a good thing. I mean, just because Victoria has a job and she has two children doesn't mean she's not entitled to try to reimagine who she is. And I don't think she abandoned the children with, you know, with, with nobody that they know. I, I mean, I think that, I think in a way, Victoria is exploring another side of herself in a very kind of Victoria way. I, I, I don't know, I think that Brandon put a smile on her face and so I'm okay with that. It's been a while since we've seen her with a smile on her face. I do wonder if we can trust him though because when he wrote his phone number on her hand with that marker, I thought, uh, why does he just have a marker in his back pocket? Like, is he writing his phone number on a lot of girls' hands? No, maybe he's, um, He's probably signing autographs with the marker, right? Never mind. <laughs> I don't know why. I just didn't trust him. And also, if he said, if he called her 505 one more time, I was going to kick him. 
I do think that Brandon is very good looking. I almost wish though that he had like long hair and a beard and he was giving me total artist rocker vibe. But then Victoria's got really, she's got all that hair too. So if they both had all that hair, it would probably be too much hair. So he's fine, he's fine. And I think he's only on for a few episodes, I guess. I don't know, does anybody know how long he's on the show for? I. I like him, I like it. I could deal with some more of this. I think that Brandon is a really nice contrast to right now to the overbearing energy that Billy is bringing right now to the show, to Victoria's life. Billy is acting like a second dad to Victoria right now. And granted, he's the one who is stuck back at home with the kids. I'm sure that's not fun. I'm sure that it makes him feel a little resentful that he is dealing with the responsibilities back home while Victoria has gone off the grid. She's not telling anybody where she is or what she's doing, and in fact, she's lying about it. But I'm sorry, it is not like Victoria has not done the exact same thing for Billy for years for years victoria was raising those children while billy went off and did whatever billy was gonna do so i think she deserves a little bit of slack she didn't leave them with a stranger she left them with people um with family so i i, I think if this is what victoria needs then i'm okay trusting her for now but i for billy's part i know he loves her and i know that he's concerned for her. He knows what she's been through and I know that he wants to protect her but I also think that Billy wants Victoria to stay inside of the predictable Victoria box because that's where she's high functioning and that's where he needs her. I mean, remember, it wasn't that long ago that Billy was spun out of control in Vegas, gambling high stakes with the company's money. And then he was off in rehab for a couple of weeks. And, and, and by the way, remember that if you think back upon that brainstorming session scene for Jabot with Jack and Billy and Summer and Kyle, just remember that Billy slept with Summer to get back at Phyllis not even that long ago. Victoria, right now, is not even a fraction as out of control as Billy was at that time. And here's the thing, I think that Victoria has become an anchor for Billy. And I think that he's afraid that if she sails away, then he's gonna be all alone and maybe he's gonna go back to some of his destructive tendencies. Billy and Victoria, I know they love each other, but maybe like Lily and Kane, maybe they just shouldn't be together. I keep thinking back about that note that Brandon left for Victoria and it said, you should let out your wild side more often, Jenny. Okay, well, let's think about that. Billy used to be the one who helped Victoria let out her wild side often. You know, that was the original appeal of their relationship. He was the crazy screwball and she was the straight arrow and he found this way of helping her bend and become something else. And somewhere along the lines, that just stopped working for them. I don't know that Billy is someone who can really ride the line very well. For as long as Billy has been cast as an adult on this show, he's had that gambling problem. And it seems like he doesn't do a very good job of balancing his bad boy with his responsibilities. He is always trying to manage his addiction. And so I think that maybe that it, it has made the dynamic between Billy and Victoria um, just a, a little less sustainable over time. He, he, you know, she's at this point, I think, trying to re-envision who she is. She's trying to get back in touch with something that could make her excited about life. And here Billy is 
tracking her down at her hotel room, standing there when she opens the door with that stern dad look on his face, like she's a teenager who just got caught skipping school. Eh, Rebecca Barlow. Eh. I don't know, she wasn't that exciting to me the first time around. Uh, maybe there will be something um, more interesting about her story this time around, something we can sink our teeth into and get excited about. Something, it has to be something besides sliding into town and just sleeping with one of our most eligible bachelors. That just doesn't seem right. I feel like you should have to earn the right to sleep with one of our leading men. And it kind of looks like Rebecca's on track to sleep with two of them. <laughs> I guess that's not fair though because um, Brandon came in and he was able to have like short-term player sex with Victoria this week out of the blue. So there's no real good reason why Rebecca couldn't do that with Nick. But Billy and Becca seemed early in the week like they were flirting, like they were going to be the ones to do it. Billy has Rebecca on this six-month consulting contract for Jabot and their whole new fashion venture. Uh, pretty sure Jack said that Jabot is on financial life support right now, and that's why he couldn't pay Phyllis a dime. But he's, but Billy is now just handing out these consulting contracts. What is the, con you know, what's she even doing for them? Consulting? I don't know. You need to put that money into maybe some products since you don't have any. <laughs> oh, well, I'm assuming that Rebecca's six-month contract with Jabot means that she's going to be on contract with YNR for a little bit longer. And then she bumps into Nick. And of course, they had that humiliating and confusing run-in several months ago, thanks to Phyllis. And seeing Nick and Rebecca together makes Phyllis jealous. You know, and it almost seemed like Nick liked it. Nick is bumping into Rebecca and Phyllis sees them talking to one another and the second he sensed that Phyllis was jealous about it, he seemed more interested in Rebecca. And I'll also remind you that everything that happened with Rebecca happened right after Sharon turned down his job offer. So, after the, their little bump, their bump into each other turned into Nick asking Rebecca out on a date, which turned into Rebecca coming back to Nick's place so that Nick could tell her all about the bar that he used to own. And then all of that translated into let's just do monkey sex until you need to go home and get some rest for the evening. I did laugh a little bit that Nick invited Rebecca to stay over and she said, you know, no, this was really fun, but I need to get home because I just sleep better on my own. <laughs> and I thought that's so relatable. You know, I mean, you cannot be sexy and get good sleep at the same time. So I like that she was honest with him and just said, no, I need to get home. Because you know, Nick would have rolled over in the morning. He would have been pawing on her before they even brushed their teeth. No thanks. <laughs> I was feeling her honesty in that moment. I'll give her that. But at the same time, it's the end of the evening. And where does it leave Nick? He's alone in his big empty house, running his big empty company that no one wants to work for. He's lonely. Nick Newman, the lonely hunk. Wait, on second thought, Jet has a vocal cord injury. Why does he need a caretaker for that? Is that weird? Is there any chance that Jet and Elena are grifters? Or I'm just being paranoid, right? They're fine, right? Elena and Jet move into Devon's penthouse and there were some good things about it. It was nice to see Jet making use of that beautiful piano. He was doing a duet kind of with Anna and I loved Jet's voice. I really enjoyed his singing moment on the show. We've had a lot of female vocalists 
on YNR over the years, but I don't think there have been nearly as many male vocalists. I mean, of course, there was Danny. You could take it all the way back, but it just seems like there's usually more women singing than men. And Michael and Lauren did mention Fenn this week and how he's on the low-budget tour for Hamilton Winters. I am wondering if that means don't expect to see the actor again anytime soon. Hmm. And also, I'm curious to know, was that actor even singing the song or was that a voiceover or a dub or something? Does anyone know if the actor who plays Fenn was singing his song, his hit song? I'd be curious to know that. Well, anyway, that's not as important to the story. What's more important is Devon one night is sitting in his living room. He's listening to music by other artists. And Elena, who lives there now, just kind of squeezes up next to him. And she's listening to his headphones too. And she's giving him her opinions on the artists. They have gotten so very, very cozy, so comfortable, so friendly, so fast. So what are we thinking about Elena, you guys? She cannot seem to stop going on about the deluxe accommodations in Devon's condo. And she also has talked a lot about how in debt she is. Now she doesn't tell Devon that. She manages to spin a different little story about why she's not currently practicing medicine. She didn't want him to know about the debt and I think that could be read a couple of different ways. Maybe she's hiding it because she wants to play a long game and get his money or maybe she's just hiding it because she doesn't want him to try to offer to pay it. I, I, I'm curious to know what your first impressions of Elena are. She does seem sincere on the surface but of course they all do and Devon is such a good guy I would hate to see him get hurt especially now he's I mean he's look he's filthy rich he's attractive he's he's got all he's got it all who wouldn't want him I just feel concerned that he could be vulnerable right now and he's lonely right now and he's about to find out that his father died I don't know I think my biggest complaint about Devon and Elena is the same thing I said last week. The getting to know you phase is so special. And the like dating phase has all of these different surprises and anticipations. And there's a lot to it that can be played on that makes you want the couple. It would be nice, I think, if at the end of their dates, they didn't just walk off to separate bedrooms in the same house. Prison didn't end our marriage. We did. Oh, well. I'm a Lillian Kane fan. Over the years, I was usually rooting for their love to conquer all. I wanted to see them succeed. So their divorce is a really sad occasion for me and I think for a lot of YNR fans. This is their second divorce though, isn't it? I think this is number two. That being said, I do feel surprisingly resolved about it only because I understand that it serves a practical purpose. If Crystal Khalil can't or won't stay on the show full time, then YNR needed to find a way to either free Kane up or get rid of him. And my preference would be to keep Kane around. I like him. And so therefore I have no choice but to try to accept and anticipate what Kane's life could look like and, and what it could be without Lily. I just think that Kane's going to have a process of getting there to imagining what his life would look like without Lily. I am really glad that we had that final scene. I'm glad that Lily talked to him in person and was able to explain her decision about the divorce. I would have been 
way more unhappy if Wyatt would have just had her serve him the divorce papers and then stay in prison and then maybe we just heard about her getting out and going off and living another life in a couple of months or something. Like, I'm glad that at least we saw them together. She talked him and us through her thought process with the hope that Kane could start to work through it too. She says to him, this path that we've been walking together always ultimately leads to the same place. And if you want your life to change, you have to do something different. I don't just want to keep going through this cycle of heartbreak. And if it wasn't going to be what happened with Hillary in prison and all that, it would have been something else. There's always something else. And I don't want to live that cycle anymore. I mean, this is a woman who has been sitting in prison. I mean, her whole life changed. How could it not change your whole perspective? And I can just only imagine that it was uh, it was just uh, wholly turning over her personality. And she realized that all of the decisions that she's made up until that point have got her where she's sitting. And if she wants anything to really, truly, fundamentally be different, she has to make some different decisions. So on a level, I feel happy that Lily has decided to make this choice for her own life. We learned that she's also making it because she's being released early. And she doesn't want to be released back into her old life. She just doesn't want to go back. She wants to go forward. So she's choosing to start a new life in maybe a new town. And she's going to start it uh, without Kane as her partner. Well, I don't think this is going to be the last that we see of her. Lily is no doubt going to be attending her father's funeral and that's in a few weeks in late April. But I mean, the fact that YNR has now had her uh, getting free of prison, she's therefore free and clear to attend that funeral and then turn around and go off into her fresh new life if that's what she wants to do. I just, um, I think the implication is that she's, of course, going to stay in touch with her children. Maddie and Charlie are graduating high school. They're adults. I'm sure that they can accept and understand that their parents are divorcing. A lot of, 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 fam of husbands and wives divorce while the children are little, and that, that's very hard for the kids to conceive of. I think Charlie and Maddie are going to be okay. I don't think Lily is really abandoning them. They're going to be going off to college, and I'm sure that she's still going to be calling them. The, th the weirder thing to me is Sam, and Sam never really became too much of a of a presence on the show. Uh, Kane's child with Juliet was more of a plot point, more of a turmoil between Lily and Kane. But it did seem odd to me that Lily seemed she didn't really address the issue of Sam. She said, "Well, I love Sam as if he's my own, but he's not my biological child. He is a product of your affair with Juliet. And I don't think that necessarily means she's not going to have a relationship with him, but she is removing our, herself from his, from his daily care. I mean, you can't live in another town and raise a child. You can't really be involved in a child's life if you don't live close to them. So that to me felt more jarring. I would say from a, a storyline perspective and a consistency and a, a character motive perspective, that seemed the oddest to me. I think maybe Lily um, is justifying a little bit. You know, I mean, when it was time to be a mom, she was okay to be a mom, but now that she wants to be something else, I think maybe she's justifying a little bit so she can move on. But I don't know. I, I, I again, it's all due to contracts and casting and people. So uh, I, yeah, I mean, I have no choice but to allow Lily to go have her fresh start. I worry that Kane's start is not gonna be so fresh. He immediately went out, got drunk, and tried to start a fight with Billy at their athletic club. Tracy had to get up between them to prevent the fight from coming to blows. Tracy, it must be exhausting 
being such an angel. Tracy's heart is so pure. She takes Kane home and she tries to counsel him and it just gives me the warm and fuzzies when she says something so simple like, I'm a good listener. You know, I mean, who, who doesn't need someone like this in their lives? Do you remember when Tracy did almost the same thing with JT? She sat down and tried to talk with him through his troubled nature. Tracy is just always so willing to help. She's so willing to see the best in people. And it's just so damn refreshing to have a character on this show that resembles a decent human being. I mean, certainly it would not be exciting to have a cast full of Tracys, but the fact that she's the one and only do, that is doing this, that's what makes her special to me. And it's also special to me that Tracy is reaching out to Kane because Lily was Colleen's best friend. Tracy lost her daughter. Tracy knows what it's like to have your entire life flipped upside down and changed in an instant. And Tracy always tried to maintain that relationship with Lily as a connection to her daughter. And now here she is counseling Kane through his loss of Lily and maybe she'll get him there. She's trying to help him come to terms with the idea of a life without Lily. And she tells him, you have to trust that Lily knows what she needs. She has, a, she's a grown woman. She knows her life. She's lived this life. You have to let her do what she knows she needs. And you need to start thinking about yourself and where you are psychologically. What is really going on here with you? And what are you really fighting for? Ah, so many baths. <laughs> Just so, so many baths. That was our Who Said It quote from last week's YNR chat. The answer was Sharon. Sharon was saying it to Mariah, uh, just commenting about all the baths that she's going to be taking now that she's out of prison. <laughs> so congratulations, Anna, Henry, Cece, Marianne V, Juanita, Jamie D, Ambreen, Nancy, Sherry, Gretel22, TB84, Jamie, Tommy, Michelle, Diana, and Liz. You guys all guessed it right. Here's another cute little short little quip for you. You tell me if you know who said it. Amazeful. <laughs> I think this could be a great new catchphrase word. Amazeful. <laughs> who said it? Well, if you think you know, then you go on over to yrchat.com. Leave your guess. And if you get it right, then you will get a shout out on next week's YNR chat. Well, let's open up the floor to our YNR chatters, starting out with Anna's comment. Anna says, it looks like we're back to the bedroom drama and boardroom drama of YNR. Yes, Anna, isn't it? I mean, I, I have always thought that um, that was an interesting way to describe YNR. It's the drama in the bedrooms and the boardrooms of the Denzians of Genoa City. And I think maybe back in the day there was a DVR, it wasn't DVR, but uh, there was a description on the cable um, info uh, that described YNR and it said something about bedrooms and boardrooms of Genoa City and that always stuck in my head and I thought that was a really apt description of the show and you're right we got boardroom drama with everything at Jabot and we got lots of bedroom drama there were a lot of lovemaking scenes this week right I mean I think they know what we want <laughs> oh Leslie says I love Victoria's new guy. She always gets the guys I want. Uh, but Leslie also says, I'm more intrigued by Brandon saying that he saw Victor at a high stakes poker game. Is that where he was during the trial? Is there a Victor imposter out there? Hmm. 
Well, I'm trying to put together what on earth that could have been because Brandon made some comment about how a couple weeks ago in Vegas, he saw Victor at a high stakes poker tournament. And at first, Brandon was saying that he thought Victor was playing poker. And Victoria said, hmm, that doesn't sound like him. The, the, even no matter how high the stakes are, the stakes could just never hold Victor's interest. Uh, but then Brandon said, well, no, actually, I think he was just talking to someone at the table. So what is up with that? I don't know, the, an imposter is a good idea. I, I'm trying to think to myself, who, who is high powered enough that would be involved in a high stakes tournament that Victor would want to talk to? Maybe it's a clue of someone who's gonna be coming on to the show. I don't know, but, but you make a good point that it's, it's very exciting to think that maybe Victor will get something new. You know I love Victor, I know a lot of people don't, but Victor's my main man. And I would like to see him have something on the show uh, that's that's a compelling storyline. Something new for Victor. I mean, he's Victor Newell. Let's do it. And Victoria was certainly trying not to pay attention. She didn't really, didn't want to think about it. You know, everything that is part of her business world causes her stress. And in Vegas, in this moment, she was just trying to be loose and enjoy herself. So she didn't want to hear it. She didn't further inquire. But I have a feeling that she will <laughs> when she gets back to Genoa City. Oh, Diana says, I liked seeing Victoria's hotel room in Vegas. It was a nice change of scenery. It looked different than the hotel rooms we usually see on the show. And I thought it was a nice touch that the television in the room was showing the various games that are available to play in the casino. Made the hotel look realistic, um, since hotels always have that uh, channel advertising for their various amenities. I am so glad you mentioned that, Diana, because that was a nice little touch. Um, it's just something to bring a little bit of reality in. And also, this could have been a hotel anywhere in the world, but the fact that we saw those casino scenes in the background pulled you in made you feel like you were in Vegas, even though we never left the hotel room. Oh, Ellen says, back off, Billy. You are not in charge of Victoria's life. Well, you know I agree with that. <laughs> Just that final shot of him and his face when Victoria opened up the door on Friday. He just looked disapproving and stern. You know, nobody was hunting him down. He would have not appreciated it very much if Victoria was hunting him down in Vegas when he was on his tear. And again, I have to say it again, but what Victoria is doing is not nearly as destructive as the things that Billy was doing. So, you know, where does he get off judging? I know he loves her. Maybe someone can balance, balance us out. Give us some Billy perspective, someone out there, so that we're not just all annoyed with Billy. Somebody, we'll get, let's get some pro Billy comments out there. Oh, okay, so T. Nicole it gave me kind of something different to think about, about Lola here. T. Nicole says, I know Lola's a grown woman. And, uh, you know, she can speak up for herself. But I felt that Abby pushed Lola to be ready for the restaurant opening. And she felt that maybe she needed more time to recover, but she would lose her dream if she didn't. Uh, especially when her dream of being the head chef is, is all she feels she has left after losing Kyle. Oh, I didn't think of it that way at all, T. Nicole. I'm glad you said that because I just thought, well, Lola just wants to be involved. She's on board for everything. And then I didn't really connect that in to the follow-up scenes that Lola had when Devon came to visit her. So Abby was very pro, let's get this restaurant started. Let's have girl power and get over these guys. And I, maybe Lola did feel pressured to say yes, because when Devon came to visit her later in the week, she was still trying to say yes, yes, yes. We well, gotta start this restaurant. I'm perfectly fine. I can do it. And the second she closed the door, she was holding herself. It took everything that Lola had just to have that conversation with Devon. I mean, how much harder is it gonna be to actually run a restaurant? And Devon was there trying to warn her about it, giving her that chance. I don't wanna see Lola fail. I think that, that would be um, awful for her, awful for Abby, awful for, awful for everyone all the way around. Uh, but really, really, that's good. I'm so glad you said that because it, that shifted my direction of thinking. And Mary Ann followed that up also and said, I think Abby's pushing Lola to be ready for the restaurant opening because of her breakup with Arturo. 
Devon was willing to wait until Lola was feeling stronger. Abby just needed to rid herself of him and is focusing on her restaurant. Lola isn't ready yet. She needs more rest and is still in considerable discomfort. Abby shouldn't be so selfish. She needs to give Lola time to recuperate. Mm, yes, I mean, this is very new Abby. Abby, I think a couple of months ago and before the Arturo thing, would have been perfectly fine to put the brakes on the restaurant for just a few more weeks. And now she is really rushing forward. Abby is being a Newman. She's just doing it with this new restaurant uh, as her business. Are we ever gonna see that restaurant? Is it gonna happen? Are we gonna have a grand opening? That's my question. Well, let's talk about Summer and Kyle. Tanya says, oh, it was so sweet of Kyle and Summer to go along with Dina in that scene. Yes, yes, Dina was very confused and Kyle and Summer teamed up to try to help Dina feel more comfortable. Kyle pretended to be Jack. He honestly had a moment where I was impressed with his Jack impression. Kyle says, yes, mother, in the way that Jack does. And I was, wow, I, I believe it. I believed he was Jack there for a second. And then Summer pretends to be Ashley because that's what Dina needs to see. Dina was asking for Ashley last week. So here, stuck in a time warp, she thinks she's looking at Jack and Ashley. She thinks she's looking at her children. Yes, it, that was an interesting little moment. Hey, Jillian, following up on an idea that Daisy had last week, says, I must say, I love the idea of Dina being a twin. Maybe the twin could be the one who has the Alzheimer's and thought that she was her twin, Dina, and the real Dina is still in Paris. I, I, we are better at writing this show than they are. <laughs> That is the God's honest truth, because that would be such a great way to get us out of the Alzheimer's and let us keep a matriarch on the show. I think viewers want that. We lost Catherine. And even though Dina's not Catherine, could never fill Catherine's shoes, I think we are sort of yearning for that, that older, uh, wiser female lead. I mean, that's a part of life. That's a part of any family. And, or I mean, hopefully, if you're lucky. Um, and, and I think that we, we are longing for that on the show. I wish YNR would respond respond to that and not necessarily like I'd rather see something like that and make the leap of unbelievability than to continue to see Dina deteriorate man it would be nice if we could send that little comment to the new writers at YNR just make make the current person that we're seeing on screen a twin and bring the real Dina back after having continued to live her life in Paris that is too good too good Gary says Jabot is on its last legs. They're desperately trying to come up with some new concept to save the company. They have no product. They're scrambling. And now Jack's latest idea to save the company is to hire Summer to help save the corporation. These people need to broaden their horizons if they want to climb back up the ladder. Okay, now Gary, I totally agree here. And I didn't get a chance to dig in um, quite as much about Jack's brilliant idea to save Jabot. I mean, what are we feeling about that, YNR Chatters? Like, it feels unrealist unrealistic, doesn't it, that his big plan to save Jabot is to not go in a direction where they're tried and true. Jabot's a cosmetics company. I would think you would just go try what you already know and make some money, not go try to become a fashion house out of absolutely nowhere. The thing is, I, I, I respond to the, the concept that Jabot is a cosmetics company. That feels somehow core to the show, doesn't it? I mean, Gary, you had kind of talked about Bold and the Beautiful a little bit. Like, is this sort of a Bold and the Beautiful type story? Because, you know, their main companies are a fashion house. And I don't want YNR to be Bold and the Beautiful. If I wanted to see Fashion Wars, I would go watch Bold and the Beautiful, but I like the original Bill Bell uh, essence of this of Jabot being this cosmetics company. There's just something fun about that, and I don't I don't like getting too far away from it. I mean, the only reason that Jack is abandoning the cosmetics idea is so that we can have a Jabot versus Fenmore's. 
That's what I think anyway. Daisy says, I loved Phyllis and Michael. It was so great to see their friendship again. I really hope that Phyllis gets the money to help Lauren and get her company back. I can't imagine that Summer has the money, although maybe she has some Newman inheritance somewhere that she can use to help her mother. Okay, great. I'm so glad you mentioned this, Daisy, because I didn't get a chance to really dig into this part either. At the very end of Friday's show, Phyllis is feeling very despondent. She can't get the money to buy Fenmore's and she sends a text message to Summer saying that she has a great idea that she wants to run by Summer. So what is it? Because I didn't think about the fact that maybe Phyllis is trying to borrow the money from Summer because Summer blew through all of her inheritance while she was gone, didn't she? Wasn't that part of her return story? So I, to me, I wouldn't, I did, didn't think about Phyllis going to Summer asking for money. My original thought was maybe Phyllis was going to Summer to see if she would want to start her own company. But then, she, but then, as you mentioned, Phyllis was talking to Michael, really going on about how much she wanted to work with Lauren. So I'm not quite sure what Phyllis is up to, but I like that you mentioned Phyllis and Michael. It was cute the way she took Michael by the hand and dragged him across the dining room so that they could go sit down. And then Phyllis sitting at the table the whole time, giving the evil eye to Nick and Rebecca, saying something about how, uh, I'm looking at Rebecca right now, practically sitting in Nick's lap, when that's not at all what was happening. And then Phyllis says, okay, well, I'm gonna get going. And Michael tells her to take the long way around. <laughs> don't make any eye contact, just scoot out the door, As don't make a scene, okay, girl? And Phyllis does the opposite. She just walks right up to Nick and Rebecca and says, Great, I love your outfit with a big old smile. <laughs> that was a great moment. You know, Phyllis and Michael have a great relationship, a great little rapport, and that might be something to look forward to as Michelle Stafford comes back to the show. I mean, the original wonderful friendship between Michael and Phyllis was played by Michelle Stafford. So, I mean, you never know. That could be something really, really wonderful that the new head writers decide to play up. You know, surprisingly, I haven't seen a whole lot of comments and opinions yet about Devon and Elena. Are they just getting overshadowed because there's so much else going on the show, going on? Uh, Laura says, I think I'm a qualified doctor. I can hand people water just like Elena, and if I try, I'm sure I can induce liver failure like I suspect of Dr. Nate. <laughs> I love how you think you're a qualified doctor because I think I'm a qualified lawyer. I do tend to channel Michael Baldwin in my daily life and like, you know, everything I know I've learned from soap operas and I feel as though I've had a very uh, excellent education in law, in the law. <laughs> And I like to channel that uh, as much as possible. But yes, I mean, if th that is what doctors do. Just handing water, walk around with a clipboard. You should get yourself a clipboard. That would really bring forth the persona. You know, I was glad, uh, switching topics here, to, to see a lot of comments about Kane and Lily. Because that was another thing that maybe got overshadowed. There's so much going on the show right now. And Lily and Kane's breakup is a really big deal. It would have been the lead story. This would have been everything if we hadn't also been going through this transition with the writers and just uh, the whole show is in a state of flux. And I didn't want Lily and Kane's um, relationship and, and the, the, the ruin of their marriage to go unfocused on. Connor says, this is one of the most beloved and respected couples on the show. And I'm not a fan of how it ended. I totally get where Lily is coming from. But what about her children? You're just going to up and move away? How could she just walk away from Devon and the other members of her family? You're being released early and we're just now finding out it's situations like this that have long lasting effects on the children. And I can't see Maddie and Charlie ever being okay with this. Oh, yeah, you know what, I, yeah, I mean, we did have that scene uh, on the end of Friday's show where Kane was trying to explain to the kids that, um, that they're getting a divorce and that Lily might, you know, is not coming back to the family. And he's trying to get the words out 
And the twins don't even let him finish. They just pull him in for a hug, and it was just that beautiful family moment. I mean, I don't know. It's so hard to say because I think Maddie and Charlie are not children. Um, I mean, they're they're about 18. They're going off to college. Um, I think they'll be okay. Just to me, the Sam thing was weirder. But, but Connor, you make a really good point about Devon. Maybe she feels awkward around Devon now. Maybe that is another reason she doesn't want to come back, but she didn't say that. Maybe if she would have said, I also feel like I can't face Devon. Um, or, or if they all had also folded it in with what happens to Neil, maybe if at the same time she was saying, I just, I don't want to be here and, uh, and you know, walk by that condo uh, or work at the company that my father started. Maybe I just need a new fresh start. That would have maybe added a little bit of another layer to Lily's motivation. Yeah. Uh, Zuberplex also says, so Lily decides to pull up stakes and abandon her family that runs completely against everything we've come to understand that lily is about they should have tried instead to explore how lily has transformed following her harrowing experience of serving a sentence in penitentiary confinement how this new lily's state of mind simply could not adjust itself to a life in domestic tranquility and how it becomes necessary for the Ashby family to have their matriarch subjected to intense psychological counseling before she could acclimate back into a state of normalcy. The resolution frankly smells like the simplest way of writing off the character. Oh, Zuberplex, that would have been a good idea if Lily would have said, I just don't feel like I can acclimate. Because that's an issue that a lot of prisoners and inmates go through. I mean, you're living in a completely different world. And acclimating to the world outside of prison, I mean, that would take some work. That would take some psychological counseling. Um, but yeah, they just didn't go in that direction. They did, you're right, they went in the direction of the quickest, quickie ride out. I mean, Crystal Khalil is not coming back and it was either send Daniel Goddard packing with her or free him up to do some more shirtless scenes. That was That's all it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that both Connor and Superplex did zoom in on, um, you know, Lily's decision to just abandon her family. And maybe that doesn't really work with her character. There, there would have definitely been some other ways to handle it. I can't argue against that. Diana says, I just wanted to add that when Lily reminded the viewers that Sam was a result of Kane's affair, it was as though YNR was trying to rationalize why Lily would abandon Sam, as well as to help viewers sympathize with her character. Yep, that is it. I think that you hit it. The whole Sam thing was definitely Lily trying to rationalize the abandonment of Sam. And that's, that, that is a Excellent point. Allie at YRChat.com says, does anyone know what movie Nick was watching on Friday? And Zuperplex responds, it was Cover Girl, 1944. Oh, how interesting. You know, do you remember when Mal Young took over and we started seeing more picture in picture? Well, it's interesting that as soon as these new writers took over, they started doing the same thing. So the movie that Nick was watching at the end of Friday's show was Cover Girl. Uh, as Zuperplex said, I looked it up. It was Rita Hayworth and Gene Kelly. The description of the movie is this. Rusty Parker wins a contest and becomes a celebrated cover girl. This endangers her romance with dancing mentor Danny. I'm trying to think about how that would have connected in with Nick being alone at the end of the episode. I'm not sure if thematically that movie was supposed to tie in to Nick or not. Uh, but you know for sure that Sharon's going back to Nick. I mean, now that Mia is pregnant, Sharon's going to take that job. Nick and Sharon are going to be in each other's orbit again, which is fine with me. But also, Phyllis was awful jealous of seeing Rebecca and Nick together. So I am wondering if the writer's intention was to bring back the Nick, Sharon, Phyllis triangle, and maybe they just really wanted to recapture the old magic and have Michelle Stafford be the one to do it. 
Oh, let's talk about Gina and Michelle. TB84 says, I just rewatched Monday's episode and the scene between Carrie and Phyllis at the club, Carrie was humoring and cheering up Phyllis despite what she did to do But it also sounded so accurate to what the real actors' situations are right now. Yeah, I know, I was thinking that too. I, especially when Carrie I mean, Carrie's looking at Phyllis, who's just been thrown out on her butt, just as Gina Tognoni just got thrown out on her butt. And Carrie says to Phyllis, women like us are at our best when we're hungry. And I hope that's true for Gina. I really do. Leslie says, I am horrified over Gina's departure. I had loathed the character of Phyllis from day one until Gina took over the role, at which point I was enchanted and wanted to be her. It is rumored that Michelle Stafford left over Michael Fairman, Murphy's, outspokenness against Scientology, which she is a devout member of, which makes me cringe overseeing her return. Ooh, okay, well I know all about that too, Leslie. I don't wanna get too deep into it or maybe I do <laughs> I feel like you know what you know a lot of people may only watch one the first five minutes of YNR chat and I don't want to get pounced on from a bunch of different directions but if you've made it on what near darn near two hour hour and a half into YNR chat then I feel like I can at least let my hair down for a couple of minutes and and uh, talk a little bit about that because I was very aware that there was some Mm -mm -mm -mm, behind the scenes at YNR when Michelle Stafford originally left. Michael Fairman, who played Murphy, was a big Scientologist in the 80s. Like, he did commercials for them. He was a spokesperson for Scientology. There was a falling out. He started speaking out against Scientology. And Michelle Stafford, and by the way, Sharon Case, are Scientologists. And there was some rift rift apparently there behind the scenes. Michelle Stafford left the show. She left the show. And now here's real juicy. I printed out, oh crap, I don't think I got this right. But I, pr I printed out a little article that came from like, I think it was showbiz411.com. It was a little article. Um, and it says this, I'm gonna read it to you. <laughs> it's good, so hang on here with me. Michelle Stafford is an avowed member of Scientology, which General Hospital knew when she joined their cast. Now, uh, this person also does mention that Sharon Case is a Scientologist, been on the show for eons as a Scientologist, but here's the soapy twist, says showbiz411.com. General Hospital started a story about a cult called Dawn of Day. Dawn of Day, not coincidentally, is an 1881 book by the German philosoph philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche that would drive Scientology creator L. Ron Hubbard crazy. So the soap cult, Dawn of Day, that's on General Hospital right now, is very similar to Scientology. Members are being roped in to pay big fees for classes. They have a charismatic leader who's insinuating himself into various characters' lives. And this isn't the first time that General Hospital has attacked Scientology. For several years, they featured a clinic for the criminally insane called Miscavige, obviously named for David Miscavige, the real life According to this article, Napoleonic leader of Scientology. Uh, there are no coincidences here, says the article. As General Hospital had this cult storyline grow, sources say that Stafford's appearance went into decline. She's rarely been on screen as Dawn of Day was put on the front burner. And now Stafford is exiting GH over contract negotiations? Could General Hospital have been using Dawn of Day at the, and that story to oust Stafford? It sure seems like it. Ooh, they didn't. Ooh, and I read it. Ooh. <laughs> Now, I think it's very important, um, you know, to be religiously tolerant. I mean, you know, this is, uh, Scientology has come under some, uh, uh, you know, some fire. 
uh, and uh, I'm aware of it. I've done some. I've definitely done some deep dives into what's going on there. But I do think it's important to remember that that's someone's religion, and we can't. You know, you can't judge somebody by their religion. But I will say, ooh, damn. <laughs> Damn, but I didn't know that General Hospital had a cult storyline going on right now and that that Michelle Stafford wasn't on this. Do we have any General Hospital fans who can confirm this info? Because I don't know. I don't watch GH. I don't talk to nobody behind the scenes. I don't know Michelle Stafford. I don't know Sharon Case. I don't know a single Scientologist. Don't know. All I know is, you know, I mean, whatever I've seen on TV, whatever I've read, seen a couple movies, seen a couple series. But, you know, I don't know. Uh, did GH do that? And did Michelle Stafford's character decline? Somebody who watches General Hospital needs to comment on that uh, and let me know. But I, again, I will say, even though this is very juicy and very interesting, and that also kind of does make me wonder, like I said, I felt like hearing the news that Gina was out, Michelle was in, what it sounds like a political decision. T to me, that just sounds like somebody just wanted Michelle back in. You know, I mean, I don't know if it has anything to do with Scientology whatsoever, um, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, you know, see, that's the other thing. This is why I don't like to dig too far into who the actors are, because it ends up spoiling me. Like, I don't want to know. <laughs> I just want to believe that Phyllis is Phyllis and Sharon is Sharon and Nick is Nick and Victor is Victor. I don't, like, I don't, I normally don't even read interviews with the cast. I don't want to watch them doing interviews on the TV. It's just, it takes me out of the moment. Like, I don't want anything to spoil my enjoyment of the show. And I've talked about this in the past. This has nothing to do with Scientology. But there was one time when I actually did watch a cast interview several years ago when Michelle Stafford was on the panel with a couple other stars and I just me personally her demeanor and her attitude and the way that she was kind of stepping on everything that other people were trying to say like she was it was seemed like the other actors were having a hard time getting in a word when she was also on the panel that to me was a turnoff of Michelle Stafford and it started changing the way I saw the character of Phyllis and that contributed to me not feeling as enthusiastic about Michelle Stafford's Phyllis and I think that contributed to me kind of being happy about the Gina Tognoni recast. So I mean that's a that's a lot. Like I just want to enjoy YNR and believe that it's real and live in my own little bubble but sometimes something just kicks down the door and you gotta go ooh ooh ooh. But again, I will say, I want to end on a positive note. Um, and I want to give Michelle Stafford a chance because what she does religiously is none of my business. I don't want to see her stepping on other people's lines in the scenes. That's what I'm going to be looking for when she comes back. That's what's going to affect how I feel about her iteration of the character. If I, because I, it was something I started noticing at the end of Michelle's runs. It did seem like she was trying to just hog the scene. And that's, I don't want that. Like, I'm hoping that Michelle, as an actress, which is the only thing I need to know about her, I'm hoping that she has evolved past that, that she's a little better of a listener, and that she uh, plays well with the rest of her castmates. Again, I'm not going to let her or anybody else ruin it for me, and I'm going to give her a chance. Here's a positive uh, Michelle Stafford comment from Chris saying, I love that Michelle Stafford is coming back, especially if Christine's going to be getting more airtime. Don't get me wrong, I really like Gina, but she was never really Phyllis to me. Well, I can see that. I can absolutely see that. Um, recasts are hard, and you're, I mean, Michelle was on the show for a 16 year stretch, I think in version 2.0, so she's got the cred on the show. I can absolutely see why people will be happy to have her back. Astra says, I really like Gina as an actress and in previous soap roles, but I was never 100% into her portrayal of Phyllis. I'm glad to know that Michelle will be coming back, but I am sad to see her go from GH. Her character storyline there was about to get juicy. I know I may be in the minority, but I loved Michelle's chemistry with Nick, and I hope they repair Phyllis and Nick when Michelle gets back. I wish Gina the best, too, and I hope maybe we'll see her on General Hospital. Maybe a recast to Michelle's character 
or uh, just a new character there altogether. Ooh, Astra. Okay, so can you confirm or deny day? What's it called again? Day, Dawn of Day, the cult storyline. Can you give? I hope I'm. I hope this whole that whole article wasn't BS. But somebody tell me, maybe Astra, you'd be the perfect person to do it. Um, did Michelle's character get sidelined during that? And also, I love your idea that what if they just switch roles? What if Michelle goes to Y&R and Gina takes over the Nina spot at GH? That would be brilliant. I mean, my goodness, the drama of daytime drama. <laughs> and one final note from Robbie here, who says, I can't even keep up with these casting announcements. Kevin is back? Is Chloe coming back too? Yes, Greg Ricard is back. We were just talking about this last week, saying we were hoping to get Kevin back, and now here we are. I have no idea when it's going to be or what it's going to be, but please, please, please tell me that Gloria is going to be following along right behind him. Okay, everybody, I've talked so long, my camera battery is going to die, so I got to go, but go to yrchat.com. There's so much to talk about this week. Please leave me your comments. Let me know how you're feeling, and I'll be reading and responding there. Okay, everybody have a really good week. I love ya. Bye.